it's good to see you. Thanks for joining me on this edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm your host, Audrey Williams. The Yuletide season is here. So in today's show, we have some important tips on how you can enjoy the holidays safely with your loved ones. Stay right there. The show unfolds after this break. If I can't kill them, you all Make sure you go get them down That is how we are go trace them Identify them Have you done trace it? Prevent disease from spreading Your health is worth defending Have you done trace it? You never think we are in tank them with pride And put the coat even out of style Tag it and trace it a message from the Agricultural Competitiveness Program of the Ministry of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Friday, December 18. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says massive investment in water systems infrastructure will be implemented soon. Asserting that the current infrastructure is mainly outdated, he says that as soon as the country rebounds from the economic fallout of the global pandemic, upgrades will be made to the island-wide water network. Mr. Holness made the statements on Thursday at the National Water Commission's contract signing for the Portmore Non-Revenue Water Reduction Program. The infrastructure is old and creaking. It cannot carry us for another 50 years. He also called for behavioral change among those who are not paying for the service to ensure there continues to be funds to provide the commodity. Here is where the big disconnection is. It is the government's cost and not my cost. Because as far as the average citizen is concerned, government cost has nothing to do with them. There's a, a, a separation, not realizing that government will have to find the resources some way. So whether it is a tax on GCT, whether it is some form of surcharge or tax on gas, whether it is you pay more for services that the government gives in terms of the government charging fees, in some ways the government has to collect the revenue. The NWC's non-revenue water reduction program for Portmore seeks to improve efficiency by preventing leaks among other things. This follows the successful implementation of the Co-Management Non-Revenue Water Reduction Program in Kingston and St. Andrew. Twelve farming groups from seven parishes now have conditional ownership for water harvesting infrastructure. The development comes as part of the second component of government's Adaptation Fund Program. The Ministry of Agriculture has presented the groups with a custodian agreement. The agreement transfers responsibility for the management, operation and maintenance of the farming assets to the groups with an understanding that once the terms and conditions are satisfied, ownership will be transferred. The assets include reservoirs, catchment and storage tanks, as well as drip irrigation systems constructed in Clarendon, St. Catherine, St. Mary, St. Thomas, St. Anne, Manchester and Trelawney. The second component of government's Adaptation Fund program is being implemented by the Planning Institute of Jamaica through a 10 million US dollar grant. The business processes of the Auditor General's Department, AGD, have been certified to the ISO 9001-2015 Quality Management System Standard by the National Certification Body of Jamaica. Industry Investment and Commerce Minister Audley Shaw formally presented the certificate to Auditor General Pamela Monroe Ellis on Thursday. The ISO 9001-2015 Quality Management System is the world's most popular international standard and allows companies to significantly improve their processes, procedures and overall profits. Minister Shaw says the standard is a vehicle to transform public and private entities as government seeks to facilitate the socio-economic transformation that Jamaica needs in order to be globally competitive. Becoming certified allows us to leverage markets and opportunities that the large countries and producers are making use of. If we are to achieve a larger slice of the pie, we need to position our country as a formidable contender. The Santa Cruz Fire Station in St. Elizabeth has received a new skid unit, which will equip firefighters to better respond to bushfires in sections of the parish. The unit, which is mounted on a pickup truck, comes with a manual reel, a pump, and a 125-gallon water tank. It was procured through a partnership with the Meteorological Service of Jamaica, with funding from the Caribbean Development Bank. <laughs> 
The skid unit can be easily loaded onto the back of a pickup and be taken or you know be driven to a location in quick time. It will move a lot quicker than maybe the, you know the big unit would. And so it's almost a rapid response unit, so to speak. The Commission of the Fire Brigade says the unit will help to mitigate the economic fallout that can result from fires, particularly on farmlands. St. Elizabeth was specifically identified because, like I said, the issue, you know, I mean, it, it is, it is the, the policy of the government to develop agriculture on a level where, you know, our food security over time can be secured, so to speak. And St. Elizabeth, like I said earlier, is the parish that is leading in that regard. Up to October 31 this year, approximately 808 fire calls were received for the parish of St. Elizabeth, 364 of which were bushfires, with 44 occurring on farmlands. Culture Minister Olivia Grange says Jamaica will be pursuing the inscription of other elements to UNESCO's representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. The minister was addressing the 15th virtual session of the UNESCO Intergovernmental Committee for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage on Tuesday. She is chairing the committee from December 14 to 19. Reggae music of Jamaica was successfully inscribed in 2018. The ministry recently submitted Revivalism, Religious Practice of Jamaica for inscription. UNESCO's representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity contains elements that demonstrate the diversity of a country's cultural heritage and raises awareness about its importance. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. Small businesses like mine continue to serve the needs of people. We all play a part in keeping the wheels of our economy turning, and we do so responsibly. We are building forward together. Though the nightly curfew is still in place, there is still lots of time during the day for you and your loved ones to have some fun and relaxation safely. If you've not decided where to go or what to do, I have the perfect idea. How about a picnic at a public garden? Watch now as we share the offerings of two of the island's most beautiful public gardens. Just remember, there are limits on how many persons can gather in public. We're here in St. Thomas at one of the oldest botanical gardens in the Western Hemisphere, the Bath Botanical Gardens. This is the beginning of a journey to discover the scientific, cultural, and historical value of public gardens. Come now. Let's explore these national and natural treasures. So what differentiates a public garden from a regular place where flowers and trees grow? A public garden is an institution where plants are collected for the purpose of education, research, conservation, and recreation. Along with Bath, there are three other public gardens on the island. Castleton in St. Mary and Hope and Sincona Gardens, both in St. Andrew. The public can access these venues at no cost. Today, we'll be exploring Bath and Castleton. Except for Hope Gardens, the Public Gardens Division of the Ministry of Agriculture, Commerce, Industry and Fisheries, MICAF, preserves and maintains these natural beauties. The objective then of the Public Garden is to conserve the biodiversity of plant life in the island. So we are here to ensure that the plants are maintained, they are conserved, they are preserved, that research is conducted on them so that generations and generations will have that area. Bath Botanical Garden was the first public garden established on the island. As a research site, imported plants were introduced here to assess how they would adapt to the tropical environment. that Jamaicans love, 
like breadfruit was first introduced to this garden by Captain Bly. He came here with the breadfruit, the Aki and Otiti apple, those are the famous ones. Other plants were introduced to the garden that people see all the time, the bougainvilleas, the crotons, all of these were first introduced to the gardens. Constant flooding from the nearby sulfuric spring destroyed many of the plants and led to a decline of the garden. Though nowhere near its former glory, the space still provides the opportunity for persons to come and enjoy nature's bounty. Bath is a beautiful garden. It's one of the gardens that has uh, the atmosphere that you come in here. It's a cool, calming environment that I would encourage anybody to come. If you want to study, you can come here and study. If you want to just come out with your church group, want to come out with any little grouping, or even yourself and a friend can come and walk and learn about the different plants that are in the garden. Bath's Fall saw the rise of this location as the premier growing spot for exotic plants in Jamaica. The garden you're visiting is Castleton Botanical Garden. It was owned by a man called Colonel Castle. Colonel Castle traveled all over the country and bring plants from different countries and plant here. So when he get old, he donated to the government of Jamaica. The government finished cultivate it and give it its name, Castleton Botanical Garden. Growing here are many of the plants introduced on the island in the 19th and 20th century. These include poinciana, bombay mango, navel orange and tangerine. One time it had over 400 palms. I think we're down to 180 species. So you have an area dedicated to the various palms that were introduced into the gardens. We also have rare fruits like mangosteen and they have another one, the real velvet apple that you wouldn't find anywhere else. This is a phoenix palm. When you knock it like this with a stone, it gives you sound. Why it gave you that sound? Because it's hollow inside. The more it grows old, the more it expands hollow. Educational tours are just some of the offerings here at Castleton. But you can stop by for a swim if that's your thing. Perhaps a cookout is more your flavor. Or set up a spot on the lawn and bask in the glory of the great outdoors. Our expedition of the historic bath and diverse Castleton gardens ends here. Sincona and hope await, but in another edition of Jamaica Magazine. Until then, keep looking out. My message to Jamaica, as we enter into the festive season, that is what we want to make it festive. We are somewhat tired of seeing persons just killing each other. We want to see a reduction in the violence. Now is the time for love. Remember the reason for the season. It's about love, it's about giving, it's about sharing and caring for each other. So we want to have a season where we see less murder, less shooting, less robbery, less violence among each other. And as we go through the season, we want to be mindful that we are contending with a pandemic, COVID-19. There are a number of restrictions out there that are governed by the Disaster Risk Management Act. I urge my fellow citizens to work with your community, work with the police so that we don't have a spread. I understand that people want to go about your normal routine I know you want to have the recreation, you want to have the parties. So let us just conform and see how best we can reduce the spread so come 2021, we can get back on with our lives as per usual. So I look forward to a wonderful Christmas and I wish for you and your entire family a safe and holy season. God bless you all.
Over the years, the Road Safety Unit has reported an increase in road crashes and fatalities on public holidays. We know you'll want to return home before the nightly curfew begins, but I implore you to avoid the urge to speed or break the rules of the road. Here are some road safety measures to keep in mind. It could be the cause of a traffic holdup, disturbing the smooth movement of vehicles. It could be the cause of your arrest or punishment, where, depending on the degree of your offense, you're likely to be fined or jailed. It could be the cause of your physical injury or that passerby having one less leg to depend on. Or it could be the cause of your life or someone else's. If you're realizing the grisly pattern here, then now would be the time to practice road safety. Road safety implies that measures are in place to limit or prevent road crashes or injuries to users of these thoroughfares. Road users include motorists, vehicle passengers, motorcyclists, and pedestrians. Measures for their safety include things like road signs, road codes, or even physical infrastructure. On the traffic network, we have various road signs. So um, we have mandatory signs and we have uh, warning signs and we have informational signs. So the warning signs are basically those signs that tell you that there is some impediment ahead, there is some issues ahead. So you'll see those are normally in the yellow and the black. So they will tell you that there's a traffic light ahead, there's an intersection ahead, there's, and there is a corner ahead, and there are other physical features ahead, or bridge, etc. We have the mandatory signs. These are signs that must be obeyed. If you disobey them, just know that you will be issued a traffic ticket. Those signs are normally red. They normally have a red in them. So keep your money in your pocket by obeying those red signs. So they are normally red and white or red, white and black. So that's the common feature of those. Then you will see the signs that are informational. Some of them are blue, some are, are green. Those just tell you where you must go, how many kilometers away you are from a particular township or location. Now after you've had a careful look at road signs as you go along, knowing and understanding the road codes becomes just as important. For us, we've seen people disobey some of those rules more than others. One of the critical road rules that we must understand is that you see the speeding thing that we love? We need to cut it out. You, the faster you are going and if you are involved in a collision, the speed at which the vehicle is going, that's the speed your internal organs are going. That's scientific laws, kinetic energy. The other one, serious risk factor, is the whole matter of not wearing helmet and wearing seatbelt. We have had too many drivers and passengers of motor vehicles parachuting out of motor vehicles. Another risk factor that out there is the whole matter of cell phone usage. Those things can be distracting, right? So we need also to minimize that as best as possible. Physical infrastructures have also been implemented to ensure a safer passage on our roadways. Observing all these measures become necessary because of the severe impact that disregarding them can and have had on our nation's people. The numbers are always alarming. But last year this time it was 218. Now it's 178, 40 less. These crashes tend to occur on the road surfaces that are nicely laid. That is not to say that they don't occur on the bad roads, you know. The road infested with potholes and bad, I'm not saying that. There are few occur on there, but majority of these fatal crashes are occurring on the nicely laid road sections. And when we look at what contribute to the crashes, we are seeing the human behavior being perpetuated. And we are losing a lot of our young people because of this situation. 
Must wear our seatbelt. Wear our helmet. So we need to reduce those risk factors. We have been giving away our lives on the road. Giving it away. 54 motorcycles dead, all males. Many of whom have their family members who, are, who they are living for. COVID-19 has caused us to recognize the importance of following rules and regulations in order to try to keep ourselves safe. Because of COVID-19, the, the, the spiral of crashes that we, had, we were expecting to occur at night, it has reduced dramatically. But what we have seen is that there is still cause for concern because in the day, COVID-19 has not caused drivers to be more careful as they drive on the road. Let us use that same impetus and spirit of wanting to live through Corona, to wanting to live as we drive on the road and not put ourselves at risk and not put other people at risk. Let us try to be each other's keeper in this season. So while on the road, let's help to protect her life, his life, their lives and our lives. customary for families to prepare a wide range of tasty dishes with protein options ranging from chicken to pork, beef or mutton. But for the upcoming holidays, why not add some fish to your menu? Here are the benefits. We all love our protein. Chicken, beef, pork. But how often do we eat fish? Is it only at Easter time or when you're at the beach? Incorporating more fish into your diet can be very beneficial to your health. Compared to red meats and poultry, fish has far less calories and cholesterol. It's the saturated fats and the trans fats that our bodies use to make cholesterol. And fish and seafood have very little saturated fat and trans fat. So in truth and in fact, that makes it a very healthy source of protein. Fish also has iron, which is important for good reasoning and memory, iodine, which can prevent mental problems in children, and selenium, vitamins and carotenoids, which are antioxidants. Who knew that we could get so many nutrients from fish? And that's not all. Incorporating fish into our diet can even reduce the chances of developing certain diseases. Studies have in fact shown that people who have a higher intake of fish compared to other meat sources have less heart disease, they suffer from fewer mood disorders, and they have less cognitive decline with age, so less dementia. This is due to omega-3 fatty acids, a nutrient that is only found in a few other food sources, such as walnuts and flax seeds. But oily fish, such as sardines, tuna, mackerel, salmon, and trout, are excellent sources of omega-3s and are readily available at your convenience in supermarkets. So we want to add fish into our diet. In what ways can we do this? So escovitch fish is one of our favorites. You now the onions and the carrots and the vinegar and the pimento, that's all fine. But we don't want to do a lot of deep frying. Deep frying adds calories. Nothing like a nice steamed fish a nice roast fish, and when you roast your fish, you can stuff it with wonderful vegetables like callaloo and so on. So we have to find other ways. Many of us have broilers as a part of our stove and we've never utilized it. We don't know how it's used. And that gives us, I think, the closest taste to fried without adding a lot of oil. So we've got different styles of cooking the fish, but what about flavor? Jamaicans love adding salt, but fish is already salty. Wouldn't that be too much sodium? If we utilize other things like lime and lemon juice and or fresh seasonings or scotch bonnet pepper or onions or scallion, we can make our fish flavorful without adding a lot of extra sodium. That sounds really tasty, 
but watch out for bones. Make sure to debone fish before giving your children. Even if the fish is bought deboned, check for fine bones with your fingers. If you're not careful, you could end up with a medical emergency. The recommended serving size per week is only eight to nine ounces of fish, or two to three servings per week. With an array of health benefits and a variety of ways to cook it, don't miss out on this lifestyle choice. Make a positive impact on your health by adding more fish to your diet. What people want are good memories to say, wow, I got this from this person and they really thought about me. So, how about looking for some pictures that you have of you and that special person and packaging it nicely or putting it in a picture frame? That could make a really nice gift. Or think about what is their financial goal that they're trying to save towards. And it may be that you put a nice little card and say, hey, I'm contributing towards X because I know it means the world to you. Or look around the home. What is it that they really want? It could be something as simple as lovely pillows. For a woman right and you may buy her a set of pillows look for something that means the world to that person it doesn't have to cost a whole lot of money it just has to show that you've put in a whole lot of heart During the festive season each year, the Child Protection and Family Services Agency hosts its annual Take a Child Home for the Holiday program, which encourages members of the public to host children in state care during the holiday period. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the program has been put on hold. However, in keeping with the festivity and its commitment to ensuring the happiness of our children during this special time, the agency will instead be hosting its Grant a Wish program. This seeks the public's involvement to grant a wish for any child or children in state care. Persons interested in making monetary donations can do so by emailing info at childprotection.gov.jm for further details. Others who are interested in making donations in kind are being asked to contact the CPFSA's regional offices to arrange making drop-offs. The deadline for dropping off gifts is Monday, December 21 by 5 p.m. So, what are you waiting on? Grant a wish for a child in state care today and make Jamaica a better place for them to live and eventually work, raise their own families, and do business. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've come to the end of another informative Jamaica magazine. But remember, you can re-watch our show on our YouTube channel or website, jis.gov.jm. You may also send us a tweet at JIS News or email us at jamaicamagazine at jis.gov.jm with your feedback, comments, and questions. I'm Audrey. Have a safe weekend. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.